Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This week I've got a review for you, an interesting new book that's just come out last year. But before I get into that, I want to go into the reasons why I select particular books. Sometimes it's as simple as the cover art or the title intrigues me. That's an important thing and it shows that the author is clever if they can think of something that's new and fresh. Sometimes I'm looking for a topic like I may be trying to read as many books as I can concerning vampires or dragons, for example. Thirdly, somebody may be trying to suppress the book, and that's what's happening in this case. And despite our First Amendment, there's a lot of cases we, we know from the fearless reporter Matt Taibbi that our government tries to censor and suppress alternate viewpoints of whatever a, the official story is. In this case, it's not that, though. It's a foreign government that's coming in and trying to say, you can't show this, you can't read this, because we don't like it. Nowadays, it is China that's doing a lot of this censorship. Anything that criticizes the Chinese Communist Party, they don't like. The author has claimed that this book is a victim of that kind of persecution, and I decided, when hearing that, that I would read the book, see how good it is, and if I did like it, I would promote it to see that free speech wins out. So the novel I'm talking about is Our Lady the Artelects by Andrew Gilsmith. You'll notice that the title is pretty intriguing. And the cover art, which I will show, is also intriguing. We have a praying android, something you don't see too often. This book is cyberpunk. It's infused with Catholic theology, though, so it makes it different from the usual bleak view that is the typical milieu of cyberpunk. It's like there's, there's no God, there's no hope, <laughs> and that kind of thing. This author, on the other hand, I mean, this author is a little different than, than typical, cyberpunk author. He is a Catholic convert. And like C.S. Lewis, the converts are typically the most zealous people. And C.S. Lewis is one of his heroes. So I believe it's already doing pretty well. He claims that this book was the highest selling cyberpunk title on Amazon. Good for him. He's been really doing well with his promotion. And he appears to have only written three books. I've written four but he's doing much better already as far as sales are going. Now, this novel is attacked by the Chinese, so he says, because it involves the Uyghur genocide. The Chinese are very sensitive to this, to this allegation, and they don't like the idea that people will get a bad opinion of them as a society. So this takes place 300 years in the future, in which the world is organized into great power blocks. One is China, now called the Chinese Economic Zone. The second is the Islamic Caliphate, which is not as backwards and brutal as you might think from ISIS, which I think is like a false flag organization. It's more moderate, maybe like Egypt or Turkey. The third is the Holy Roman Empire. Now this sounds nuts for a future book to have the Holy Roman Empire, but as the saying goes, the historical Holy Roman Empire was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. And I think that kind of applies to this. It consists of, apparently, most of Europe and many of Europe's former colonies that are majority Christian, including much of Africa. And this is a multi-ethnic empire. In fact, the emperor, who appears to have been elected, so more of a figurehead than an actual sovereign. He's a Filipino <laughs> named Capulong. It's a good Filipino name. And they call him the Habsburg, even though, obviously, he has nothing to do with this Austrian dynasty, although the emperor is based in Vienna. As far as America and Russia, I don't know what their political status is, and the author doesn't get into it. And that's just as well, because it's not really relevant to the story. Now, regarding the Uyghurs, Backstory is that Muslims in China, that all of them have either been converted to atheism, 
killed outright or deported from China. And that there are refugee colonies of these Uyghurs in many places in the Caliphate. Currently today, there's about 12 million Uyghurs in China, supposedly. And it does sound like they are being at least oppressed in the sense that the Chinese don't like them practicing their religion. Now, in this novel, in the 24th century, there was a much greater massacre of Christians in China uh, because there was this huge minority, like 100 million. The Chinese Christians were getting tired of being second-class citizens, and they rose up and said, we demand equal rights. The Chinese government, in typical Maoist fashion, massacres them. I thought it was a little implausible that they would kill that many people. Uh, but in any case, I can see it, it happening. I can see that sort of thing happening. So there's another reason why the Chinese Communist Party hates this book. In this future scenario, the Catholic Church is alive and well. Now, that may also seem unlikely, but the Catholic Church has been through a lot in the last 2,000 years, and it probably will persevere. In particular, although it seems to be overcome with wokeness these days, we know that a lot of the Catholic faithful are conservative third-worlders. They're much more into the traditional beliefs, and I think that will probably cause the church to revert somewhat from its leftist dogma right now. In this scenario, the earth is kind of muddling along. We don't have this galactic empire. We have some space technology, but not a lot, not any big space colonies. We have a lot of development of AI and electronics. There's been no utopia, but at the same time, there's no collapse of civilization due to climate change and whatnot. Some problems with that, but it's kind of been addressed. About 70% of all humans have these bionic implants that help us interface to the Internet and all this access to knowledge. And most people have them because they're necessary to get a good job. And this is in both the empire and the Chinese economic zone. The caliphate discourages it. It's seen as kind of, kind of uh, anti-religious. So when they say in the book that 70% of the people have them, that pretty much means almost everybody outside the caliphate. Also, AI has vastly improved, and there are a lot of these artificial beings, these androids, uh, that they call artifacts. I don't think Gil Smith coined the term, but I love it. <laughs> it sounds like an artificial, artificial analect? I don't know. <laughs> and I've seen it referenced before the book was published, but I don't see it in the dictionary. These creatures are not replicants. They are not biological. They are mechanical. Although they are a very good imitation of the human being. And uh, they often can almost pass for human, except that they do have vastly improved physical and mental abilities. What's unusual in this book is that they are suddenly starting to see visions of the Virgin Mary, which is crazy because they're machines, they don't have souls, and they haven't been trained in religion. So why this would happen, nobody knows. I will try not to give spoilers because this is a new book, and it's better for people to go out and read it rather than hearing everything from me. At the same time, some of the stuff in the rest of this review will reveal what happens partly in the book, so if you're really worried about that, don't watch the rest of the review. So there may be a few mild spoilers starting now. As the story begins, we meet a particular artilect, an android, named Thierry. He belongs to an African businessman, kind of a tycoon, called Mr. Okpara. Now, Okpara loves this android. He views him as part of the family, like a friend, and they discuss philosophy together. In fact, he seems to have gotten to another level beyond this normal android's. Now, one day, Cherry goes to the cathedral in Benin City, here in Africa, and he starts to pray, and he becomes like he's catatonic. He won't wake up, and he won't come home. And Opara becomes worried that this artilect has become possessed. Now, because Opara is a faithful member of the church and a big donor, the Vatican listens to him, and they send an investigator one of their top exorcists, 
Father Gabriel Serafian, who comes direct from Rome, over the high-tech hyperloop to Africa. Now, Father Serafian is a good choice because he also happens to be an AI expert. He helped develop the training algorithms for the Arlect's moral training. It's analogous to Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, that robot may not harm a human, etc. But of course, since real life is more complicated, they have to run through all these scenarios, and there's all this training as in real AI, and I have some experience with that in my day job. It sounds true to life, let's just say. And so Father Serafian comes to see the artelect at the cathedral, and it speaks to him. And it's not the robot's normal personality speaking to him. It seems like it's some kind of being that's possessed him. So whereas the father thought it was a hacking attack, probably a hoax, no, he becomes immediately convinced that this is a real demon. And the demon shows him these visions of the future, uh, showing how the world will be attacked, that the, the human population will come under some kind of bizarre attack spiritually or mentally, and that the demon also says that the Artelex have developed souls and that they will belong to the other side. <laughs> and so he's convinced, the father is convinced, he's terrified. At the same time, the emperor, who is on good terms with the Pope, but he wants to see what's really happening, so he dispatches one of his agents. This is a warrior Amazon named Namono. She's, I guess, a nun? But she doesn't look like a typical nun. And she is a trained killer. And she comes to Nigeria as well, to the cathedral, where uh, the father is convening with this artelect. And at that moment, it comes out of its trance, and Thierry says, there are evil men coming to attack you, watch out. And indeed, some men with automatic weapons arrive to shoot up the place. Thierry selflessly stays to hold them off while Nomono helps Father Serafian escape. And although the bolts bounce off his skin, they use an electromagnetic pulse weapon to supposedly kill him. Now the priest and the nun, Serafian and Nomono, they flee to the Caliphate, which occupies northern Africa. And basically the emperor is on good terms with the sultan, so they uh, contact the authorities and they set up a conference call between the emperor, the sultan, and these two representatives. And the sultan says, I had a artelect in my harem who has escaped. She killed two guards. And I feel that these things are connected. And so I'm going to set you up with this holy man. His name is Sheikh Tilawadi. He's a Uyghur. He's a refugee. And he has some insight into what might really be happening. So Tilawadi believes that this is connected to his former home of Xinjiang in China, where the Chinese in all these camps, they experimented on these people and they used their personalities to help form the early artelects. So this torture, it was like the Nazis doing medical experiments. These experiments were used to, to further technology. So Tilawadi believes they have to go back and he thinks this is where this golden android, yes, her skin is pure gold, because <laughs> the Sultan owns her, uh, she is headed there to convene with her fellow androids. So it's dangerous because they have to go into China, and China will probably shoot them when they enter. It becomes a very complex plot and involves a lot of characters and a lot of basic different ideas. They weave in some heavy-duty science, including astrophysics, and religious, uh, religious legends, including the Fatima prophecies. Now, if you've never heard about that, if you're not Catholic, you probably don't know, the Virgin Mary supposedly appeared to three separate children in 1917. She appeared six times, and one of these kids became a nun and recorded all this stuff and sent it to the church. First prophecy involved the ending of World War I, which is currently raging. The second prophecy involved World War II. And the third prophecy involved the chastisement, or persecution, of the Christian community 
The church kept this secret until the year 2000 because they were worried that the communists would use this as an excuse to persecute even further. However, there's a conspiracy theory that the church never revealed the whole prophecy that was only set out part. Limited hangout, if you will. So it's kind of a religious conspiracy as reminiscent of the Da Vinci Code. And, and similarly intriguing. So we see lots of uh, questions that this addresses. The nature of humanity. Do AIs have a soul? <laughs> as in Blade Runner. The relationships between Christianity and Islam. In this book, they've, they've kind of repaired that. But the Chinese atheists, those are the ones that don't get along. And there's this third prophecy, the chastisement. They believe it will be some sort of astrophysical event that will affect the implants of these millions and millions of human beings. It's a very intriguing book. It's exciting. There's a lot of nail-biting action near the end. So I highly recommend it. Four and a half gears out of five. The half a gear I deduct for pacing in places, especially early on as the author is setting the stage, there are places where it seems to be a little too much philosophizing and not enough action. In any case, if you're reading it, persevere. It'll get it'll get better, and it is interesting nonetheless. Now, as far as the weaker thing, now at the end of the book, Gil Smith gives a link to a site that's supposed to be helping the Uyghurs fight back against this Chinese oppression. Now, I have kind of mixed feelings about this. I'm very skeptical about anything I read in the news. I don't trust the Chinese, of course. They are a very closed society, but at the same time. I don't trust our media because right now the media or the government, our government, is doing a lot to try to demonize Russia and China. So they may be exaggerating what has been happening to the Uyghurs. I have no doubt they're being oppressed. But as far as genocide, maybe not. I don't know. Check it out and decide for yourself. I, I highly recommend you do that. So for now, please give me comments below whether you like this or not whether you know anything about the Uyghurs, uh, and any suggestions you have for future videos, that would be fantastic. Please also like and subscribe, because it helps us to get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is Steampunk Tesserado saying, I just amigos from the Steampunk Tesserado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.